hit record now this thing has a horrible habit of when i hit record my internet goes down so fingers crossed it's going to stay up but <laughs> with that said let's go with it hello everybody welcome to techno social we are here with jason horsley today who is the author of a number of books most recently 16 maps of hell a book about hollywood and the dark underbelly of it um jason i've been going through the book and it's I noticed that reading it, it actually has a pretty strong effect on my uh, on my nervous system. And I think that's a credit to you as an author, right? It's like, it's heavy stuff that you're going through there. And I think the way you manage to communicate it kind of drills into the depth and almost the horror of, uh, of what you're trying to communicate. Could you give us a little sense of what 16 Maps of Hell is about? I can try. That's uh, it's very interesting. You started with the nervous system because I'm writing a lot about the nervous system currently at my blog in relation to working with Dave O'Shana and his his approach is 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 about the nervous system and how we can relax the nervous system by um, addressing the ways in which it's got locked up through trauma and abuse and social conditioning, which is very much the underlying subject matter of 16 Maps of Hell and, and all of my work. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, actually, that you started there uh, in terms of feeling it in your nervous system. Like I would hope on that subject, I would hope that my books would, would lead to a relaxing of the nervous system. But you're, you're suggesting that the intensity of the material might actually be quite stressful for the nervous system. So I'm kind of I, I'm, I'm curious about that right away maybe we can come back to it because i don't want to just ignore your question absolutely um, i'm happy to talk to that in a second yeah so what what the book is about well uh, it began as a book about hollywood obviously in the dark underbelly of hollywood um well actually it began as a series of blog posts called psychological operatives in hollywood but you know same same thing essentially my attempt to understand what hollywood really is and what what is the true nature of the product that comes out of it. But it's ended up being quite different as all of my recent books ended up being different than when I started them because the process of writing a book changes me, the writer. So then by the time I'm finishing it, I'm not the same person I was when I started and then I'm rewriting it. And potentially that can go on forever. Sometimes I can't even finish books because of because that keeps happening. Um, and in, with 16 Maps of Hell, something that happened was that after I'd assembled the data, which was about the underbelly of Hollywood, and I was going back over it, I realized a number of things. The main one being that I hadn't really uncovered the theme of the book because there's no theme to that. Like Hollywood is a den of iniquity slash um, a covert cultural engineering program slash a mob run, you know, network of abuse slash intelligence, military propaganda at slash slash slash. You know, what what's the theme of that? There isn't really one. That's just kind of hidden history. But the theme that emerged as I re-looked at it was um, the relation between torturing the women that is so pre predominant in Hollywood media um, and um, how that relates to torturing our own nervous systems, why we enjoy stressful imagery in movies, and dissociation. This whole thing of the trauma reenactment uh, compulsion that we have and how that relates to dis a dissociative mechanism in the psyche so if we keep if we're traumatized we're trying to resolve the trauma and we unconsciously keep re-traumatizing ourselves which doesn't work of course unless we become conscious of it but the way that it works in the short term is it allows us to dissociate and uh and, and movies are a dissociative aids, of course. They take us into fantasy realms, which is what dissociation is all about. The theme of torturing the women is one I trace from, you know, modern day Tarantino, let's say, and Polanski's the main subject of the book, um, through Hitchcock, obviously the, the key kind of movie 
film director influence on all subsequent film directors through the surrealist Dadaist um, avant-garde movement and then back to secret societies like this ancient tradition of secret societies so that's that's roughly what the book's about mm -hmm. Fantastic. I mean, so to go back to what we were saying a moment ago about nervous system, I think, well, I've noticed that as I've been going through the book and indeed your work, there's been this kind of draw to it. I've been almost unable to, to put it down and to stop listening to podcasts and reading the book, especially today, but also finding that I think the way to phrase it would be this kind of feeling like a drain, like going into quite an intense low energy state. And over the weekend, actually listening to one podcast, a bit of a sense of, of dread as well. However, I did also notice that today about three o'clock when I stopped reading the book and uh, went to just take a couple of hours to chill and get ready for the interview, I did actually feel a really strong sense of relaxation which is interesting. And I'm kind of curious as to what that might be about. I think so. I haven't gotten that deep into it, but I've read the first couple of sections um, around torturing the woman around Polanski and then was getting into the third section where you're starting to think a bit more about um, drama and these parasocial relationships, which is what I'd love to ask uh, a bit more about in a moment. Um, this sense of kind of creating these characters that then take on a life of their own outside of the, the existence of the performer and the audience. Um, but before that, I mean, is there anything you'd like to bounce back about my nervous system? Yeah. Well, so just, just today, this morning post is a blog post, um, inspired by based on the last day of Shana event, which was yesterday. And in it, there's a section or well, centered really around this question of discomfort and how we tend to avoid discomfort. And when we, one of the ways we use to avoid discomfort is by, um, indulging in habits that allow us to numb numb the nervous system so movies junk food comfort food and so on and the problem with that of course is is that if we numb out the discomfort it doesn't actually the source of it doesn't go away and so the alternative approach to that is we'll be willing to not take refuge in the dissociative tools and aids and be stay in the discomfort and keep the attention on the discomfort and the way that Dave O'Shaughnessy described it is that um, if we try and avoid discomfort it becomes a lock like a lock that we can't you know get through whereas if we put our attention on it the attention is the key and then the discomfort becomes an opening and see his his context is enlightenment and what enlightenment is and in this context we're talking about today the opposite of enlightenment is dissociation or vice versa enlightenment is a state in which we are completely not dissociated we've become fully associated with reality and the where his work and my work converge because my focus is on the dark as you've noticed no doubt 16 mass of hell um so really my focus has always been on what prevents enlightenment, or the ways in which we're not enlightened, we're not mm. fully ourselves, we're not fully at home in our bodies. And, but the convergence here is this thing of the discomfort of the nervous system, which of course then ripples up into the emotions and the thoughts and everything else, this, this general dis-ease in our lives and in our bodies, and that the only solution is to allow ourselves to just keep paying attention to the areas of discomfort, to the things that we really don't want to think about or experience. And that although, as you maybe, as you're describing, that can feel enervating or draining or dispiriting or, or the or kind of the opposite, but but still not positive, like agitating and, and dreadful, creates dread. If we stay with it, then the lock becomes a key. The the thing that we're trying to, we want to dissociate from starts to reveal things to us that actually we've spent our whole life trying not to see. And the, all of the energy, and I've observed this in my life, all of the energy that we put into not seeing something, 
into keeping it at bay, then gets freed up little by little because we're no longer using our resources to, to not see something. Then we let ourselves see it. it. It is liberating, but because there's that period, the transitional period in which it, it, it can feel oppressive. Right, and that helps to make sense actually of the, um, as I said, this kind of being drawn to the work, kind of with this dark fascination, because in a sense, I think what you are doing is lifting a veil on on mainstream culture, on or on whatever this thing is, and the the veil that it has cast over most of us in terms of our our perception, uh, the way we relate to ourselves and our our environments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, as maybe you haven't got to in the book, but it's in all my books. There's an intensely personal focus for me in writing. There has to be, otherwise, you know, why do it? And um, yeah, I've been under the spell of Hollywood to to use an easy phrase for my whole life. Like I grew up with movies, and to this day, I I still use movies and TV to escape into. Um, and, and so I'm trying myself to reveal to myself or let myself see the real nature of, it's a bit like, you know, junk food, like we eat junk food for comfort food. Um, there's two things that can happen. One is we can become more aware of what, what, what the cons constituents are of that food. And, you know, it's just so we can't really deny, okay, this isn't nourishing. I might carry on eating it, but I can't kid myself that there's any kind of nourishment in that. The other thing that's harder but much more important is to to become sensitized in our digestive system and our whole nervous system of the effects of these products. Um, so anyway, with Hollywood, as well as with junk food, not that I'm an addict or anything, but I still like comfort food, I, I'm hoping that eventually my awareness and my constant focus on the real nature, the qualities of these things will change my relationship to it and, and sensitize me to the effects. I mean, I have noticed I'm much more sensitive to violence in, in media than I used to be in the, last, in the last couple of years. I've become much more sensitized to images and even descriptions of violence to the point that I will feel it in my body and I, I look away now. And I'm somebody who used to love violent movies. My first book was about violence in movies. And now I try not to watch too much violence. And if it, if it is violent, the show I'm watching, I tend to look away. So maybe that's an example of becoming more sensitized. And it's, to get to your, your point, it's, it's very difficult to override a cultural imprint or an installation or an interjection that goes all the way back to childhood. It's even pre-verbal for many generations, for recent mm -hmm. generations. Wasn't quite for me, but but I mean, parents put their, their infant babies in front of TVs now, or give them smartphones. Um, and that, so that's even while we're developing language, which means we're developing an identity, which maybe isn't a good thing anyway, but, but we do. And that, so that our, our whole sense of identity is um, configured by these cultural implants or interjects that we take very early on. So actually overriding that or uninstalling those implants, well, I'm not saying it necessarily works only to do this, but I think it does help to um, understand how they're configured, to go as deeply as possible into understanding what the constituents really are. Mm. You mentioned a very interesting word there, which was the imprinting or the installation. Now, um, we're kind of up to date with what you mean by this, but maybe we could get a little bit into the techniques of that imprinting and sort of the effects and the objective that it fulfills as it is done by these so-called wizards. Mm. Well, the original wizards are probably, probably best to say anyway, are our parents. Um, and I mean, this is central to the theme of, of 16 Maps of Hell and my other books, that the, the conspiracy of spell 
craft that we associate with dark wizards is effective insofar as it's instilled us with these values and methods and and tactics unconsciously so we've become complicit we've become instruments of the spellcraft so yeah our parents probably went freemasons or illuminati or part of a satanic cult well they may have been of course in some cases in my case they were fabians my grandfather was a fabian so that's a whole other can of worms so there was there were some elements of secret society in my family i think but even if there aren't um you know most parents perhaps we could say try to do their best by their children and are simply doing what they think is right and necessary to give them to socialize them to prepare them for life but it begins right with the first time that a parent says to a child says to us um stop fidgeting or wipe that smile off your face or what are you laughing at or or shut up or you know or whatever it is that whatever we're expressing is wrong or is in, inappropriate that's the beginning of the the negative imprinting or the distorted imprinting i mean there can be positive imprinting of course you can't have one without the other um uh but anyway so i think that the basic principles by which we're condi- conditioned through parenting um and caregiving um can can be and are applied in a scientific fashion to manipulate and shape and configure a society but it's, it's a bit of a chicken or an egg thing there because of course our parents are configured by their parents by their mm. parents and so on all the way back and society really is just a conglomeration of these configurations of socialization it's mm. all parenting in a certain sense and you know the machiavellian social engineers or the techno wizards behind our society they also had parents they were also parented so it's a big old train wreck really of of trauma well, i call it trauma genesis really the the main principle one of them was one i've already referred to seems to be the application of trauma as a way to um create a false identity which is a dissociated state which is configured to please the the original traumatizers or, or conditioning so-called caregivers while at the same time um to avoid any kind of behaviors that might be displeasing so i mean we all have this don't we we all have this innate desire to be liked and to please others and we're always thinking how am i coming across we're not necessarily thinking am i being myself if we were to ask that question constantly uh we might find that actually we're not and we're not able to because we keep referring to these inner voices that say if i say or do this i i won't be accepted well that the self the core self can't ask that question can't consider that factor but an infant has no choice but to find ways to please if it's going to survive because if it gets rejected it may die so i think we've all been traumatized socialized imprinted in such a way that we stay at an almost infant state of development while at the same time mentally we we're kind of mm. um accelerated we get we accelerate into a mental sort of development mm. which is dissociated um but it doesn't it might allow us to cope in society but coping in society really means um well being a good producer doesn't it being a being a productive member of society which means being a cog in the, in the machinery of metropolis mhm stop stop in a movie reference at the end there <laughs> So one of the most interesting references as well archetypally so i want to i wanted to dive a little bit deeper into two things that you said there or maybe riff on that um one of them is you mentioned this dynamic of how imprinting or installation happens generally through these overarching principles of parenting 
the, the positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and how that might, you know, unfold. There's a whole palette of things in there. And there's, um, and let's classify that as being kind of a face-to-face -face thing. Maybe what, you know, those of us who grew up on the fringes of the internet might look at and might think of, you know, it's MK Ultra. It's how people brainwash other people or how some sort of dominion is established one-on-one. -on -one. But there's this other dimension that I also wanted to throw out, which is the dissemination of this trauma writ large throughout the collective. So, you know, kind of the constant repetition of these same tropes and, and, and in such a way, a way that I'd love to explore and try to understand a little bit better, in such a way that it also sort of imprints not only the actor or the individual, but also society at large and the collective mind. And there's kind of these two these two vectors in there. Would you agree? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I quite follow the line of thinking, but but what came to me uh, is something that I've touched on in previous works is is how there's a um, congruence between our personal traumas, our individual traumas growing up, and the sort of cultural products that we're drawn to. And again, there's this overlapping layers because the people who create the culture, the culture makers and the gatekeepers that decide what gets created, they have their own traumas, particularly the, the, the makers. Like a, we have this idea of art, which is that the artist is working out cathartically their own problems. And there's a lot of truth in that, even with Hollywood products, which are corporate streamlined and, and, and greenlit mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And so... There's a, there's a correlation here between the kind of products that the culture puts forward and that we're drawn to and the trauma that the culture maker is trying to resolve and our own personal individual traumas that we ourselves are looking for relief from. So we're going to be drawn. We're, we're not only going to create a culture that matches our trauma, we're also going to um, subscribe to one. So in a certain sense, we've got, like you have audience cults. I was a Clint Eastwood fan, so Clint Eastwood was, was my thing growing up, or well, one of my things. Um, and it took 30 years to look back and start to see, well, why Clint Eastwood? Because to me, there, there wasn't any, I didn't have to ask that question at the time. It was Clint Eastwood because Clint Eastwood was cool, right? That was all there was to it. But in fact, no, of course it's not random. It's not, and it's not, in, it's not, um, empirical either it's not as though Clint Eastwood has these qualities that I was seeing and they are in themselves virtuous on the contrary but nor was it just some kind of random subjective choice as it was the the Clint Eastwood industry if you will the archetype in the industry and the parasocial relationships that 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 that, that generated um, was was a response to uh, a particular demographic, let's say, and that demographic um, had particular formative experiences in their lives, uh, mostly men in the case of Clint Eastwood, that led them to be imprinted, let's say, by by the Clint Eastwood image, because it matched the teeth. Mm -hmm. Clint matched my wound. It's incredible. So what you're describing sounds like a little bit of an A-B testing where there's a sort of natural magic that happens between the people and their internal composition and then the sort of cultural products that they will gravitate towards. Yeah. Um, so would you say that um, there's any sort of um, what, what is what are the criteria or the objectives of these culture makers, excluding the unconscious parts of fulfilling their own traumas, which they will obviously always have to do in one way or another. But is there any architecture, any agenda to this culture craft? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a conundrum or an irony, I suppose, because I try not to exclude the unconscious agendas. I try to zero in on them that seems to be where the real meat is but they're unconscious so they are by their definition excluded um that one has to use guesswork there uh i think 
they're in a certain sense consistent probably in that the conscious agendas tend to be the shadow or the mirror of the unconscious and generally what we see i'm now i'm, I'm answering this very generally first but generally what we see with the unconscious is is that um and this i think this is how conspiracy quote unquote works is that the things that we consciously try and bring about um they often lead to the very opposite result and this this is kind of the nature of the unconscious that if if the things we try and the things we try and achieve and the way we try and achieve them are really geared as a way to escape discomfort original trauma but we're unconsciously trying to reenact it to resolve it we will bring about the very opposite result to the one we think we're trying to bring about so there's there is a mirroring there if you look at the con the results you can you can guess the conscious intentions and and they'll be this Huh. Well, this is I'm getting I'm going to get all tangled up here, but they might seem like this was a conspiracy because, let's say, you get a front, an organisation that's supposedly supposed to protect children and care for them, but actually it's run by a pedophile ring or MK Ultra, and it's really a front for the opposite. Well, you could say, so that's all a conspiracy. They just pretended to be this in order to do that. And you wouldn't necessarily be wrong. But you could also say, well, it's not simply a conspiracy. It's that these people really consciously wanted to help children, but their motive was an unconscious desire to escape their own trauma. And because they were seeking relief from their own deep trauma they ended up abusing the kids because their conscious motivations were weren't sufficient to overcome their unconscious drives and actually abusing children is a way to try and unconsciously resolve you know individual mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all right mm -hmm. so again i've answered that very generally haven't i but um um so it seems to me i mean i have looked for an overriding unifying theory of social engineering like what do they want what are they trying to do to us um and i mean there's two ways of coming to mind one that's probably pretty obvious is that the goal seems to be total control total control over society and all the individuals within it technology obviously is very central to this um and that's consistent with the psychodynamics of somebody who's been abused, who's suffered extreme powerlessness as, in, as an infant, that they have an overriding, overwhelming need to uh, overcome, escape that feeling of powerlessness uh, as adults. So they, they try and become as powerful as they can. They try and have absolute control over their circumstances because that was the thing they didn't have that was so traumatic as infants. Um, so that's one thing, and that might all seem fairly straightforward. The other, perhaps less so, the, there seems to be a, a relationship between attempting to have control over others and forcing their disembodiment or facilitating their disembodiment. The less embodied we are, the the more dissociated we are, the easier we are to control because, or partly because anyway, because I'm sure there are m many different angles to this, the less reference we have to physical reality, the less we know how to respond to it, the less we're in our bodies, the less we can refer to our own instincts and our senses to tell us how to move through in our environment, the more we're going to look to, well, initially i mean we would think we were looking to our own thoughts to tell us but essentially we're looking to external uh pointers signs maps and so on language being central to that so if you if you dis if you traumatize and dissociate an individual or a populace uh and in such a way that you know that they will turn to certain um artifacts or whatever things being provided for orientation then you're 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 laying the groundwork essentially for adults who will be totally dependent on your drug your mm. uh, you know your um guidance uh and because they've got no um recourse to their own 
So the disembodiment agenda, as I call it, uh, it's not it's not written or talked about much. Prisoner infinity mm. is very much about this. We can see it though. We can see it with the technology. I mean, even, unfortunately, even us today, we're all communicating, connecting in a, a disembodied fashion through the media. Uh, but hopefully, we are compensating for that by the subject and the, and the quality of the connection. I'm not saying that technology in itself. Um, well, it's just an, let's say it's a necessary evil at this point, but uh, we can certainly see that that many, if not most, people use technology in a way that further disembodies them. As in, not only are they disembodied because they're using technology, but they will use it in a way that um, reinforces the program of the technology, which is that your Facebook profile is who you are. Um, it's better to text somebody than look them in the face and talk to them, even if they're right there in front of you. You see what I mean? So the values are, are changing. Uh, they're devolving and, and always more and more towards disembodiment, I would say, and the transhumanist uh, white elephant or whatever we call that, that bugaboo, is, is the, it's just the most obvious or observable face of it, the transhumanist goal. But I think we can see, I mean, the millions of people never heard of transhumanism. Um, and might, if asked, they might scoff at those ideas, but, but they wouldn't perhaps notice that they are embodying, ironically or paradoxically, they're embodying disembodiment. The child sex thing is both horrific and so darkly interesting to inquire into because it seems to be this horrific universal and you don't have to dig very far at all to get to it, whether that's in Hollywood or in religious institutions or in other areas of the elite and i find myself pondering right like what is it there are a number of options and maybe the reality is these do not mutually exclude each other is it that there are a number of people out there who really just like fucking kids and will do anything to be able to do it is it that these people are traumatized and that's why they're living it out is there some kind of the political agenda whereby you produce um, damning footage of, of other people in this kind of way that Epstein is supposed to have done. So then you can blackmail others. Is there even an element of the, um, the dark occult ritual whereby a group of people commit an act that is so beyond, beyond the bounds of what is morally acceptable, breaking a taboo together in such a way that we are inextricably linked to each other in a way that's kind of emotional, psycho-spiritual. And it doesn't necessarily need a material probe, like some kind of blackmail tape. It just is a kind of perverse brotherhood and sisterhood between people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the list goes on, doesn't it? Not to mention a billion dollar industry. Uh, and I think one can, can definitely can map it, if one wants to map hell, from the, from the, the most profane to the, I don't know what we'd call it, it's certainly not sublime, is it? But it, it's not really transcendental, but very esoteric and very elaborate sort of rationales behind it. Uh, I think it is good to, to keep one's feet on the ground and to profane that, that yeah, this is a huge industry. I mean, there's, there was awareness in the last couple of decades that, um, or more really, that the drug industry basically fuels modern civilization. And if it weren't for these, for all these drug cartels, uh, including the CIA as the overriding one, moving cocaine and other substances, um, it's a billion dollar industry, that, that's propping up the economy. Well, I don't know much about that, but I know the books have been written about that. Well, it's probably true for the child porn industry as well, right? Um, child trafficking. I mean, that's physical, the physical movement of children for 
for sexual use, just a horrifying underbelly to our society that, that props up, like it wouldn't run without this, this kind of industry, which itself is a hor horrifying prospect to consider. And yeah, of course it does lead to the deeper questions, well, how and why have we ended up dependent on a civilization that itself is fueled by the life force of children, you could say. I mean, it's like these this dark archetypal imagery that we have of primitive society sacrificing babies to, to Moloch or what have you. We're still in that society, it seems to me. And we've changed the surface and we've added all these surface veils so some people can still have the illusion that we're living in a civilized society and that, you know, things are pretty good for most people. Well, at a certain level they are. Perhaps things are more comfortable for more people than they've ever been before. There's more people anyway than there have been. So, but, um, but yeah, under the surface, probably more people are suffering more horribly than, than any other time in history as well. And throughout it all, it seems to me, I mean, it used to be that, that infanticide was, was quite normal um, and open, openly practiced as a necessary means of keeping a community stable, just as we see it in the, the animal kingdom. Uh, and... Uh, and now the idea of inf open inf infanticide would be horrifying. We'd think, my God, it would be the worst possible society that would allow for that. And there's probably a correlation between those two things that, again, the, you know, the things that we hide and we push out of sight become the things that trap us. And the, the more unconscious behaviors become, the worse they become. And I think, to try and get to your question, there's, there's a there's a there's a dynamic in our society, which is that those who rule the cryptocracy do so in secret, and they do so based on a um, certain practices that themselves are secret, but also they are the the inverse. It's like it is like the, the superculture is a shadow culture that the way in which the elite and I'm very wary about talking in these terms because I think I know there's a trap in them, but uh, configure society and, and control society depends on um, doing so in the shadows and doing in the shadows uh, inverse behaviors to those which are the rest of us are doing and adhering to. Uh, and I think, I mean, it's just really difficult, if not impossible, to talk about on a large scale because we just don't have a clue. But I think that, except what's coming, <laughs> and we're getting all these clues, but it's getting distorted on, you know, on the way to us. We end up with, with very distorted narratives like QAnon, for example, and Donald Trump is going to save us, right? That's how far we get from the reality here. So I think it's really necessary to bring it down as quickly as possible back to the body and our internal space and the psyche, that, that we can see that in our own lives, that there's this split in ourselves. Um, and the, well, I'm not sure, actually, maybe I'll just leave it there for a second and just, um, yeah, I'll just leave it with that because it's, it's a really big question. And the whole, the whole child thing, yeah, I've written a lot about it. Uh, and I still will talk about it, of course, because it's central to what I write. Um, but it's, it's a massively delicate issue. And to me, anyway, central to it is we're really talking about our own bodies here. Things happen to our own bodies, even if we weren't sexually abused or traumatized as children. Um, but we might have been and not know it, but even if not, Things have happened to our own bodies that correspond with this. So that's the area of maximum discomfort. So when we talk about these subjects, it's very risky because it actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for going into the d deeper layers of our discomfort. But because of that, it's going to be a temptation to go the opposite way and go QAnon, Donald Trump's going to save us, 
uh, you know, or get the damn pedophiles, you know, and get out the pitchforks and the, and, and the torches kind of scapegoating thing as, as a way to deal with the real issue, you know, which is in the body uh, and further dissociate and just perpetuate the, uh, the madness. Mm. So yeah, hopefully that wasn't a block. I don't want to block the question. Um, it really is central. There are people, I mean, I heard recently from somebody who I quite like about his podcast and he said, well, I can't have you on my podcast because my partner is allergic to talking about conspiracies or child sexual abuse. And I thought, well, now I'm thinking, well, at least he's honest. But I thought, God, I mean, heck, you, you can't talk about anything then. <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. all roads lead to, to Babylon. Mm -hmm. That's where we are. So that's a very interesting avenue <clears throat> to, to actually start to characterize because while at the small scale, one might be looking at the ability of some of these culture crafters to produce cultural artifacts that have some sort of, um, let's call it unique architecture within themselves, that by being witnessed by a, la a large array of people, might, uh, for example, pre-install some of these memes into their reality tunnels and thereby make this, this, this sort of creation more widespread, more, more understood. Uh, and there's an element of, of expansion of power in that. But it also feels like you, you've alluded to deeper undercurrents of domination that go beyond just this one that I just described. And these deeper undercurrents have to do with, you know, resolving collective trauma and how the people actually culture crafting these things, they might themselves have been put there by their own sort of background. There's also the natural flow of how, you know, techno capitalism advances and there's sort of, you know, if there's, it's like you, you mentioned the drug, uh, the drug trade as being this, this thing that fuels the economy and there's the child trafficking trade that is, you know, it's coming out as something also very big. So that does, that, that doesn't feel inextricable from, from capitalism, for example. So this is like deeper cause number two, deeper cause number three might be something like warfare competition. People want to get ahead of themselves or get of each other. They use blackmail. They, they entrap themselves like that. And it all feels like this, it's all very interconnected also because much of it is, is behind the scenes is something that we cannot really see, but we can map some of its effects. And I think that it's like you said, the things we don't see or want to see are the things that are used to trap us somehow. And I found that to be very interesting. Um, mm. I think they can also be used to trap us by getting us to look. <laughs> so it gets even trickier. Mm. Because they obsess. I mean, they they can obsess us. Mm -hmm, like we, want mm -hmm, to, we start mm -hmm. to understand a little bit, and then we we need we think we need to understand more. We think we need to understand everything, and we we can't. We just mm -hmm. can't. It's incomprehensible the scale of this. And you know, just this conversation now here today, and it's not the first time I start thinking it's hopeless. The whole situation mm -hmm. is hopeless. I, I start wanting to say, well, we just fucked. Accept it. Right? But that's not actually not how I feel. Mm -hmm. like in my own life more and more oriented towards nature, towards the body, towards community, towards human beings, towards love, acceptance, peace. It's all, it's all getting better. Well, I'm getting older, so I've got more aches and pains. But essentially, and so there, there's a bit of a trick and a trap in this, and I, I don't know how to reconcile it. I mean, this is my attempt to map how the idea was, if I map it thoroughly enough, I'll identify the point that I entered hell, how I got in this freaking mess in the first place. And then that's the way out. The way in has got to be the way out too. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a trick, of course. Um, uh, so, so the, so yeah, I was just, I mean, my, my intellect and I'm not, I don't want to denigrate the intellect. It has its place thinks that, there's a way to understand this, to comprehend this, that actually all of this is, 
is somehow a natural organic process that we're we're caught on the inside and so we can't all we can comprehend is well once we've stopped thinking what's in it for me you know, how can i benefit from this hell world which we, we might just find ourselves thinking more and more you know it's hell i'm in hell you know what's wrong with the world how did it get this way how can i change it um so to to, to somehow allow that it might actually be exactly the way it's meant to be or has to be it's very very tricky you know there's, there's there are platitudes to do that but but is it possible to really understand like i i i always used to go back to the analogy of the chrysalis as in the caterpillar and the chrysalis that somehow we are having to externalize our unconscious trauma collectively and and and, and act it out unconsciously in such a way we can actually see it and if we fully see it then <laughs> we'll we'll change we'll, it will mm -hmm. it will resolve it so we might implode mm -hmm. um, we might suicide i think we could we could make a case that the human race is suiciding currently from the pressure of not seeing mm -hmm. slash seeing like this combination the nervous system is going more and more into lockdown from a combination of trying to repress the truth with a reaction to having to see it, right? to these two mm -hmm. things. And so again, it's back to, and then we want to relax our mind to relax our body and that doesn't work because the mind comes after the body. So it's, for me, it's, it comes back to nature, like nature, even though we do seem to be doing everything we can collectively to eradicate nature because we can't control it still nature is is dominant i don't mm -hmm. i don't personally believe in an environmental crisis i think there's a human crisis and yeah there are some ripples in the environment but the earth the nature itself is so much stronger than human beings in my experience mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's true individually like if we keep checking with our bodies it's not exactly that everything's okay in our bodies, but that there is a solution. The body itself knows how to restore balance to the system, and it's mm -hmm. constantly trying, if we'll let it. Mm -hmm. um, so collectively, I mean, that is a way to flip it over. We'd say, rather than there's this Machiavellian elite that's trying to control us all and ruin everything, that collectively we are trying to resolve something and one portion of ourselves that's fragmented off is 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 hoarding and exploiting the life force in such a way that we don't have access to it and the body is dying well that, that's true at an individual level too but hating our own identity or our ego or whatever you want to call it and saying it's evil is not going to resolve it actually because it's only that way because it's configured that way uh as a as an infant that's never grew up that's fueled by these id the drives of the id just insatiably to try and get what it wants it really needs uh ironically it needs comforting it needs reassuring that it's loved that it's okay needs embracing and then it can be integrated. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't gone through the the other mm -hmm. end of this process, but I know that yeah, gentleness, kindness, understanding, uh, relaxation. These are the things that work. I'm not mm -hmm. saying we should go to Bill Gates and cradle him in our arms like a baby. Uh, one can't take this into the the realm of the literal. But in terms of how we perceive the others. The, the 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 elite really are like these man, gray aliens is another analogy but these super babies the yellow what are they called in the hg well story the loi isn't it with the huge heads that are basically like infants that mm. have uh, well yeah it's the progress part and the regress part there's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. drives of the id and then there's the the superego, which is this, thinks it's sort of above it all. Mm. Who's controlling who, really? There's, there's a, it's kind of this, this interplay between Apollo and Dionysus, or this uh, underbelly of, of, of the id, of unrestrained desire that will do anything. 
it wants. And then there's the Apollonian, the, the restriction, perhaps the institution. Let me tr perhaps try to uh, let you know a little bit where my line of questioning is, is coming from. I feel like it's possible for us to do, um, you know, let me start with the beginning. Um, perhaps on the larger uh, time scale and space scale, maybe us, maybe humanity is uh, undergoing some sort of transformation in a chrysalis. Um, and many times also when I've had these conversations, I've, all, I've also felt sort of hopeless, sort of, okay, then what now? The conspiracy is so large and we attribute perhaps such force to the other that it becomes a little bit, uh, an effect of psychological warfare, which is learned helplessness, which is something that I learned by reading one person who was also involved in some of these things called um, Michael Aquino. And he was talking about learned helplessness. And uh, there was also this book that I once read called, um, it was by Fritz Springmeier, the Illuminati formula to create a perfect mind control slave. And that was kind of my entry point to a lot of these subjects. Now, one of the, um, interesting things that I found is that it is possible to do an inverse mapping. So despite many of these subjects uh, 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 being sort of technologies at the service of the id of, of, of people who, you know, are in themselves unrestrained. And so what we're looking at when we read a book like that, for example, is this is unspeakable. This is horrible. The amount of trauma they're putting people through in order to dominate them psychologically. But then on the other hand, there's a sort of establishment of a craft. The craft is to dominate attention, to dominate a human, perhaps by putting them in disembodied uh, states. And perhaps that's something that we, each of us or collectively have to progressively solve. But that doesn't make the, the necessity for an analysis of the craft less important. Uh, because you don't want to go into a, a room of people full of guns and you have a knife, uh, which is kind of a, a weird twist on the saying. And so much of our interest here in Technosocial uh, uh, is, is around obviously technology and the occult, how that influences philosophical ideas, but also something called ontological design, which is this idea that um, there's a creative discipline that today with the advancement of technology is able to design people. And in many ways, the Hollywood, let's say elite, also has these ways, more crude, less crude, of designing people. Um, you look at, uh, if you read secret societies, or if you read the, the older things about old cults, it feels like there's a common line to this, a common thread. You mentioned that some of it gets a little bit more esoteric, and more symbolic some of it not so much there's also the question of how this these symbols seeping into po into popular culture mm. so i guess if you could if you could take that what 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 comes to your mind oh i was hoping you'd, you'd end on a question because i was just enjoying listening to you uh <laughs> yeah no I, I don't know can can you help me out because of course it's coming to mind so my point is, is uh, there's a craft, that craft uh, of, of trauma-based control and of uh, sort of the imprinting or people's reality tunnels. It feels like uh, we're talking about people that have had a monopoly on that for a long time. And for the past hundred years, these, they've used their place at the top of the broadcast pyramid yeah. to continue to do that, whether it is for the Fabians or the Freemasons or whether they're doing it for the CIA and the military industrial complex. Well, that's a niche. Someone filled it. Someone knew how to fill it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so, something you said about people. Um, I mean, because, uh, yes, there's people that we can name and there's uh, organizations and institutions we can track. And certainly a lot of my last few books have been exactly that. There's a lot of data in there, facts, names, dates, places. Um, and I find it useful for, I think, the reasons that you were just underscoring that I want to understand the methodology here. And one of the reasons I want to understand, or perhaps the primary reason is, I don't know if reverse engineering is the right phrase. I never quite know whether I'm using that rightly, but I want to undo what was done to me. 
And if I see what was done and how it was done, that's going to help me. Like if you understand how you're programmed, then you can, you can uninstall the program more easily. And or perhaps, and this is consistent with the psychotherapeutic view, um, just by understanding the program, that itself uninstalls it. Mm -hmm. They happen sim simultaneously. That is the unprogramming. Yes. That's been my experience, really. Once we see the programming, then it's no longer working. It's no longer running our hardware, to use tech metaphor. So that um, that's why I'm I'm content to up to a point to talk about people, individuals, not so I can identify, expose, and blame them, mm -hmm. but so that I can see the components of the program or see the methodology better by observing or what they say and what they do. Um, and thereby uh, correct it. However, I, I zeroed in on people because it's possible that this this kind of meta question is central to to getting free of the programming. What what are people? What what do we mean when we talk about people? Is there such a thing as people? Are there really? Because there are human bodies and there are names. We we put names on them, but um, I, I suppose the central question is agency. And one of the things I hit on, it's in 60 Maps of Hell, but specifically around the conspiracy, the conspiratorial mindset, is there's, there's, there's an intrinsic paradox around the question of agency, which is central to the idea of what people are, I think, or whether they even exist. Because conspiracy is largely about how we're stripped of our agency because we're being controlled. So, so who are these controllers? Aren't they products of previous conspiracies? Have, are they somehow outside the system completely? Doesn't seem likely. I mean, David Icke, of course, has his reptilians and others, Whitley Strieber has his aliens. And, but even if you're going to go into other dimensional beings, they're still, they must enter into the system in order to affect it. So, once you enter into the conspiracy, then you're being affected by it. It doesn't seem, as with parenting, there's no way to actually be um, immune to the effects of the system that you're infiltrating or, so, or trying to direct. So then if, if the conspirators stripping us of agency don't have agency, well, mm -hmm. who's controlling who, right? Mm -hmm. this, the larger question then is people, what are they? Do they exist? Is it, or is it life force that's that's moving consciously or unconscious? Different levels of consciousness, different mm -hmm. levels of of engagement, and bodies with different levels of life force that they have access to um, that have been installed with these ancestral mm -hmm. hungry ghosts called people. Their programs, like hundred percent, hundred percent. One of the ways that we um, think about it. Uh, 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 might be sort of different scales of personhood. Uh, the smallest of which might be the meme. The second largest might be the apparatus. It's a pen is a way to think, is a way to be as I write, right? There's a way of relating to my environment. That's why technology sometimes is so important or so interesting to look at. Then there's what we would traditionally call a person, me, you, two different beings. But then you mentioned something very interesting, which is there's bodies that are larger in scale and that are larger in time span. So those might belong to the newosphere. They might be these larger entities, these super organisms. Is that what you're referring to? Something to uh, well, that effect. I, I wasn't going there, but I, I suppose I could. I mean, I, where I went when you mentioned larger was, was groups because, and mm -hmm. I was talking only about demographics, like Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. found different audience cults. And I do think this is central to social uh, engineering. It's crowd control, isn't it? First mm -hmm. of all, they've got to create the crowds that they want to control. And I've, I've used they there again, so, but it's us, isn't it? We want, we need to create the crowd crowds that we want to control. Um, other people might misinterpret that and think I'm identifying with the elite that I'm not. I'm just trying to include ourselves in what's happening. Um, what was it saying? Oh, so, so yeah, an audience cult is, is an artificially engineered 
collective organism, let's say, uh, that can serve the purposes of other artificially but more consciously engineered collective organisms such as the CIA or the Fabians or, or whoever. Um, I mean, and this raises, I don't know if this might be a digression, but this does raise this interesting question of how much autonomy or responsibility or influence an individual so-called can have within an organization. Like I've often, or not often, but I've heard criticism of comment statements about the CIA as being irresponsible because the CIA is a collection of individuals and so you can't say anything about the CIA because the CIA doesn't do anything, only individuals within it do do things. Mm -hmm. And so there could be people doing good within the CIA. So to say the CIA, you know, is this malevolent organization is, is an error. I don't, I don't know. I understand that point of view, but I think I would counter it. And this hasn't answered the question directly, but maybe it will get back to it. Is I would counter it with an organization or a larger entity, whatever we're going to call it, egregore, may have more, um, it may have a momentum that none of the parts can, can alter or influence. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if this did address your point. I mean, your point did seem to include, you said, the newosphere, the possibility of um, what would we say, like overseeing bodies that might be able to influence from the outside. Mm -hmm. No, sure. I think I think you've answered it very well because I, I feel that from a practical point of view, there's really no distinction between the audience as the people who compose this larger entity and the supposed pure mind body that constitutes that. I think they're inextricable. You can't really separate a worldview from the people who have that worldview. No, right. The same society. We have this idea about society and the individual. Well, can you show me the line <laughs> between the two mm -hmm. or mind and body? Can you show me the line between mind and body? Mm. You're also part of the I don't like Descartes club. Yes, well, definitely. Although he's a pretty low bar, a low hanging fruit, or whatever the expression. I don't know who does like Descartes these days. <laughs> I suppose that the transhumanists, maybe, who want to say, I have a Facebook account, therefore I am. <laughs> <laughs> want to upload, upload themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the words that come into my mind here is worshipping at the temples of different gods. And in some sense, these egregores, shared minds of societies that we've been talking about are the same things that once upon a time would have been called gods. And it's something again, that we're interested in exploring is the ways that humans in the past have interfaced with these, these gods, these egregores, these super organisms, either to tame them or to get power from them or anything or along be, that uh, spectrum, really. Or to be uh, absorbed into them, become one with them. Absolutely. Which is, I guess, either a gaining of power or surrendering of power, depending on which way you're looking at to gain divine agency or to surrender human agency in preference of something larger. And where it's, where it's connecting with something I was thinking about today, which was in, um, in the chapter on your book, as I've mentioned about, um, about drama, about Hollywood, but also about, um, you mentioned Greek drama, right? And there's this sense that the Greeks did drama, they did tragedy. And tragedy was this incredibly important aesthetic, religious innovation that was able to provide some catharsis to the society, to the viewers, but also notably by 
concealing the ultimate apex moment of the tragedy, concealing the moment where where Medea murders her children, for example. Mm. And I loved I loved in one of your footnotes there's this idea that precisely the the hiding of it invites the complicity of the audience because we have to fill it in with our own imagination. Mm. So we're reminded that we're complicit in whatever the horror of this story is. And somehow, despite the horror, despite the tragedy, it it brings the state together. And it's curious how that is different to say what we have with the violent movies of Hollywood, where the violence is it's violence poor now almost the more violent the more explosive we can be the i was gonna say better i don't know better that's the way we do it now and it's the question that's coming to my mind is and is about the difference between say perhaps Athenian civilization and our own and the way that we're constructing our dramatic dramatic narratives and presenting them do you have um, any thoughts on this? Well, I, I'm not very well versed. I'm definitely not a historian and my history is terrible. Uh, and I refer to Greek or other things um, as a bit of cherry picking. Like, oh, I think I can see some correspondences here. I'm just trying to paint a picture. Um, there does there, def, there does seem to me anyway to be a continuum, an observable continuum between Greek culture and our own. I mean, obviously there is in, in a number of ways, but um, a devolution of something. And there seems to be, uh, you're probably using a lot of seams, I know some listeners get irritated with that. I don't like to make categorical statements because I actually don't know a lot uh, of what I'm talking about, a lot of it's very intuitive, but it seems to me um, that we're becoming more and more empowered, quote, in the in the worst way. So what the Greeks were handling, a certain degree of knowledge, awareness, um, even technology, like what you're talking about there was the theater as an aid to catharsis. Um, I feel like I want to use other terms for this because I don't think we have a very good understanding of it that um, imagery, performance, sound, uh, embodiments, you know, actions, theatre in a, in a nutshell which is now more movies and other visual media uh, is, is a kind of technology with many moving parts that inter interfaces with the psyche just as our, our, our environment does. Um, and the fact that it's manufactured doesn't reduce that, the impact on our, on our psyches necessarily at all, but it does increase the potential to direct and control it. Like when our psyches interact with and are, are um, affected by our environment, by nature, well, that's what, whatever we want to call that. It's the whole of nature is imprinting us, is, is inspiring us, is guiding us, is informing us. When it's theatre or visual media or whatever, uh, it's being shaped by individual minds with whatever degree of conscious awareness on the part of the people who create it and the part, uh, the part of the people who receive it. And so, although I wasn't there back in ancient Greece, or if I was, I don't remember, it seems to me that they, there was quite a high level of awareness relative to today in terms of the, the, the power and the responsibility of that technology on the part of both the creators and, and the audience. Um, Whereas now, uh, the power seems to have increased, but the responsibility seems to have been diminished. And um, mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, it's the sort of age-old um, 
it's the sorcerer's apprentice is the is the parable isn't it of choice the disney movie the fantasia thing frankenstein is the other one promethean the promethean thing that we've 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 inherited these these tools without a clue of how to use them and we've been using them and you know over the centuries and we've been evolving in quotes got to put it in quotes progressing um and and you know the cliche or the familiar scenario is is we it leads to self-destruction uh 20 years uh, well 40 years ago in the 80s i grew up in the 80s the nuclear war was a real threat although i didn't i wasn't particularly worried about it but um it was very tangible this idea that the technology we've we've inherited or created and unleashed m may destroy us nowadays we've we've got the environmental crisis um and we've got certain things we blame that on mostly it's human beings we do blame it on ourselves <laughs> although i tend to blame it on the consumer rather than the corporations right that create it um where was i going with this um i was definitely going somewhere uh oh that um it's not as tangible to us how how we might be destroying ourselves anymore i personally i think the environment's a bit of a red herring or i don't know what kind of audience you have they might not like that uh but i think it is a bit of a red herring in a number of ways and i think that the thing that's destroying us is is more to do with how the technology is interfacing with our own bodies and what we're doing and what's happening to and in our own bodies that, that that's the nature that we're destroying that's my personal sense uh and the the other thing i wanted to just throw in at the end here uh was that that we're not too cognizant of is that is that the kind of technology that's destroying us isn't exactly literally the hardware it's more like the software so the techno and i've just really had this thought now but the technology of the ancient Greece the the Greek theatre, if we're going to call it technology, um, is so much more powerful than we imagine. Like well, the thing in the book about Socrates talked about how theatre creates phantom... Um, I can't remember the exact phrase now, phantoms of reality, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And that those phantoms of reality possess us. And so then they, they control us. That's the power of the technology, the imagery, I mean, of theatre, visual media, etc. stories, the, the phantoms of reality, the dissociations from dissociations. We're already dissociated, and then we create new dissociations to, to, to ignore or forget that we've dissociated. And of course, those dissociations, well, the further they get from reality, the more fantastic they are, the more they are about empowerment. Oh, we're actually becoming gods. We're transcending to, to, to Nirvana or Valhalla. We might believe that we're superheroes. We might believe we're enlightened. We might believe we're, you know, technocratic, uh, ruling elite who are going to upload to the cloud. We might believe we're going to go to heaven and sit next to Jesus Christ, whatever it is, you know, there's these disembodiment fantasies that are telling us the opposite of the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think notably drama in ancient Greece, suddenly much of it and the tragedies were performed at these religious festivals. If I'm remembering it right, they were dedicated to Dionysus. And that tells you something. It is heavily institutionalized and ritualized. There's a time of year when these performances are put on. There's a sense of, of shared meaning making around it and something you point to in your book as well that the performers wear masks right which is in some sense a barrier between the person through which the the character the archetypal energy is being expressed and, and the performer which again we don't have that in today's dramatic cultural products it's available on demand and especially now we've got our computers and we've got netflix it's never been more on demand i mean i just old enough to remember videotapes and then dvds for a few years but then 
kids grow up now and it's all available on YouTube at the click of a button, right? So you've got strong archetypal forces available at the push of a button and no nothing to remind you that it's an illusion and no ritualization to remind you of the the intense strength of what is being summoned here. I mean, I suppose this, to take it to open up a slightly other angle, it's one of the unfortunate offshoots of the secular secularization of society, right? It's that we now completely, because we've d- disavowed the existence of anything supernatural or archetypal or spiritual, there are many words for this, right? We will then not allow ourselves the... Um, the practices and the preparations for for engaging with these uh, with these cultural products. Another example would be the way we approach psychedelics now, um, as opposed to being, you know, a, a a rare journey taken by an initiate or someone of clear shamanic training. Now it's buy a bag of mushrooms and pop some acid when you're 17 years old. And I say this <laughs> as someone who's done it, right? Mm-hmm. That's, there's, there's, I think it comes back to this idea, yes, of trying to clutch for power, but without the responsibility to have it. We don't even know that there's possible to have responsibility around it. Well, yeah, I think we have a, we've got a refurbished or a re, interpreted idea of responsibility i think and it's 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 very individual oriented so i'm thinking my own personal journey which corresponds with exactly what you were just saying now i call i mean a part of it does um i call it my icarus phase now but at the time i i i believe that i was the one as depicted in the movie The Matrix, and that what that meant for me personally, individually, was that the archetypal egregore energy of Lucifer, the fallen angel, had selected me to be one of his avatars, that he wanted my body as an avatar to incarnate in the planet, and that would that would redeem the Luciferian current or what have you. Don't even ask me how I ended up with this belief, imbibing all kinds of different cultural influences from Castaneda to Jung to Crowley, etc. But anyway, I really, I, 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 I took it to the bank, literally I wrote a book about it and a film and, and it really, it really took me over, it took over my hardware, this program. And, um, and it involved a lot of psychedelic use and uh, particularly Salvia Divinorum DMT. And, um, I felt I was being very responsible at the time. I thought I was taking on the ultimate responsibility of redeeming Lucifer. So, (laughs) but, and it was all about my own shamanic self-empowerment. Absolutely. Of course it was. That's what being the one is. I'm the one, right? Nobody else is. Just me. Um, So... Yeah, I think we get tricked. We definitely get tricked and everything out there in our culture is there to trick us, I suppose, because we're tricking ourselves. Um, For me, I mean, and hopefully for others too, it can, it can be useful to do a crash course on in delusion. Because I mean, we, we're, we've taken on these cultural implants very young. So it's not as though we can just read the right book or meet the right person and say, oh, that was all a lot of nonsense, was it? The only way we're really going to see the way in which we've been possessed individually and collectively by these phantoms of reality is, is actually, I think, maybe, you know, maybe there's another way of divine intervention at least. But for me anyway, the only way was that I let them possess me and started acting them out. And then I saw, I saw what I was doing. Thank God. I mean, cause some, many people don't see what they're doing and they might make a career out of it. They might become the next Terence McKenna or Alistair Crowley or Whitley Streeter or, uh, whatever. And my mind suddenly went blank cause there's so many names I could name. I'd like to knock down as many false idols as I could in a single sentence. But anyway, <laughs> pick, pick your eyes off. 
chances are, if you've heard of him, he's been archetypally possessed and made a career out of it and therefore never got to see that he was possessed by, or she was possessed by a phantom of reality and helped to make a false reality more real to a whole bunch of suckers. So do you think these archetypes are, are false? That's a, that's a great question. I thought you were going to qualify it, but it's great as it stands. Um, I thought I was too, but then I realized that <laughs> <laughs> stopping there felt stronger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it depends which archetype, maybe. I mean, if if an archetype's arrived to us, because well, Christians might get upset at this point, but if I, particularly if I got specific, but um, if it's arrived to us, it's arrived to us through human beings and probably more likely as well through 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 writing you know or movies or whatever you want. obviously it's through movies then we know it's probably bogus but uh, even if we're going to go to ancient texts and ancient so dionysus apollo lucifer um the idea of lucifer all the ideas i had about lucifer were false including you know i thought i'd corrected course corrected because i knew that lucifer wasn't just satan he was the light bringer who was the firstborn of god the first manifestation that had got been assigned down deep into matter to enliven it and then and then lost his way and forgotten himself and become set you know i had a whole gnostic revamping of it many much of which i'd come up with myself i thought so I felt I'd course corrected, but the fact, but then I got corrected by reality when I ended up having a psychotic break and almost killing a cat and attacking a girl that I cared about and becoming actually quite violent for a very brief, fortunate period in my life. Um, and I realized, oh, wait, the devil's not a nice guy, is he? You know, I had to, I had to course correct back to the Christian viewpoint to balance out this crazy Gnostic Crowleyan thing that I'd, you know, mm -hmm. replaced it with. Uh, and of course, neither are true, because Lucifer, if there is any reality behind Lucifer, something that completely transcends not only my own mental capacities, but the mind itself, as or language at least, so therefore, completely off the map you know i don't know to this day was was i genuinely archetypally possessed which wouldn't be a good thing anyway but but was it a genuine archetypal possession or was it a fragment from my traumatized childhood maybe put in me by my abusive brother who also wanted to be lucifer um that i had animated and reified through the, by giving it my own life force maybe that's all archetypes are you know Maybe they're just egregores created over aeons that are, are, are siphoning off our life force. Certainly we can see that with Hollywood and George Clooney or Ben Affleck or whatever. These are the archetypes we've created and we're giving them our money, our time, our attention and our energy, our love even. They're giving us the, them the most valuable commodity, not a commodity, the most valuable, valuable quality we have, turning it into a commodity mm -hmm. and feeding feeding the egregores. Being that time itself is the only thing that we have that doesn't scale, that we can't really have more of. So by giving it to these siphons, as you've called it, um, naturally it feels rather... The, there's a few questions. That, let me start with one. You speak about this embodiment. Um, and I just wanted to sort of as an example to maybe our listeners who might not be very aware uh, of, of, of this, if you could pick like an example of a psychological operation, just one illustration so that we might look at it and pick it apart and maybe use that as a case study, um, okay. which one would you pick? Well, I just picked the one that popped into my mind and see if it works, and that's the moon landing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if the moon landing happened or not, uh, I don't really care particularly, except I'm interested in the ways in psychological operations. Mm -hmm. But whether or not it was, the moon landing was clearly a psycho, I mean, the appearance of a moon landing was clearly a psychological operation, even at the most surface level, mm -hmm. because it, it showed people, or made people believe that America was the great and mighty and could, could leave the earth and go to the moon. 
So that would be level number one of the psychological operation propaganda to show ahead of the Russians, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, then we have, I don't know if it's level number two, but another level, which is the, the rumors and theories that came up in the last whatever decades, that the whole thing was faked and manufactured, whether by Stanley Kubrick or not, right? And that's clearly a psychological operation. Well, uh, in one of two possible ways. One, if it was faked, that's obviously a psychological operation. Two, if it wasn't faked, what's all this evidence that it was? That must have been manufactured and salted into the, into the newer sphere or the, or the internet sphere to make people believe we could use the flat earth if we want to hear, but I don't know as much about that one. Uh, and so then you've got all these people believing and doubting. The, the, the core of this to me is that, and this is definitely relevant to the flat earth thing, is that we don't know, we can't uh, ascertain whether the moon landing happened or not. There's, there's simply no way. We, we, we just have to refer to the so-called experts, whether they're the, the experts at NASA or the experts uh, at um, whatever, pick your respectable, reputable conspiracy theory site, right? Mm -hmm. or, or revisionist history to, to rebrand it in a slightly less incorrect fashion or that, that's to, you can go to jail for revisionism, can't you? So either way, you're kind of damned, but people obviously put plenty of stock in it. And I would say rightly some of the time, uh, specifically the moon landing, I personally don't believe it, but I try not to disbelieve it. Um, the, the core thing anyway, hopefully does answer the, the question is, is that, um, well, there's two elements. One is, we're, we're believing things or, and or trying to find things out that we can't refer to the body to do so. Not at least, maybe we can, but only that requires a real sensitivity. I would say that our bodies do know whether human beings ever made it to the moon or not. We do know this in our body, but you can't just say, hey body, what do you say? And your body's gonna you know, wave uh, yeah, once for yes and twice for no. You can do muscle testing, but but you can't be sure if it's accurate. If you get my point, but um, by and large, to try and figure out the nature of a given psychological operation, even if we're not aware that it is one, or, or respond to it, we're going into our mind or our, our emotions. So that's disembodying. Um, the other thing, which is Maybe it's the same thing. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it for a while. But that if if an as like every psychological operation, it seems to me one way or another is about creating a narrative that at the very least doesn't have all the facts. Often it's just totally fabricated. I'm thinking of the an easy psyop to go to. It's in the book. Is the vampires killing Vietnamese soldiers? Well, they really did kill Vietnamese soldiers, but but and then they drain the blood and hang them upside down to make it make the Viet Cong think it, it wasn't Vietnam actually I think I'm in fact it was in the Philippines but anyway um, those kind of uh, psychological operations that make it make they they enact something real but then they add elements that make people believe something that isn't real and true or mm -hmm. it's just out and out fabricated but in either case if we believe it, our minds are telling us something that bodily we know is untrue. Like we'll have this experience as children when our parents, well, as an example I just used, slap us on the back of the head and say, don't hit somebody. Well, that's cognitive dissonance. Which do you believe? Your body just got hit and you're going to want to hit back and you're also being told, shown that hitting is a way to to get people to do what you want, your mind's being told, don't ever hit. You've got to split, really. Um, your, your parent will tell you, you're a really good boy and well done, when actually they think that drawing's a piece of shit. They just want to make you feel good. You know, they're trying to be a good parent. They're lying in that way as well. And we know, right? We feel bodily, if so, or, or better example, as our parent says, I love you, and they, they, they don't feel it in that moment. They just want, or a partner, they just want to 
to let you know that they love them and, and to reassure, right? But we don't feel the love. So, so that any, any, any uh, experience in which what we're told or our mind is telling us or, or working with is incongruent with what physically we're actually experiencing, that increases disembodiment. If we go with it, if we if we recognize it, it can, we can flip it over and actually say, oh, wait a minute, there's a split there. But if we go along with it, and that's so heard the trick of conspiracy mindset is, is it's the second matrix. Um, it will say, moon landing was a lie and here's why. And and so we we go from believing one story to believing a new story rather than staying in the liminal space, which is, well, now I don't know which to believe. This is what I've been in with Hollywood for years, and I still am. Like, I've written this damn book, but I've still, I've been listening to audio commentaries again just for the hell of it, and I still find myself listening to Paul Thomas Anderson thinking, he sounds like a nice enough guy. He couldn't possibly be part of the things I'm writing about in the book. My God, maybe I shouldn't have written that book. Maybe it's irresponsible. There's such a discrepancy between between these two versions of reality that it's it's almost irresistible to just want to be fully committed to one. But actually, the the way out is the liminal space, which is, oh, I thought the moon landing was real. Oh, now I realize it isn't. Oh, wait a minute, actually. How do I know that more information won't come along and I'll go back to believing it was real again? I better just stay with I don't know. And staying with I don't know, all kinds of things open up, including, well, I don't actually need to know, do I? Who cares if we made it to the moon or if the earth is flat? You know, really? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm going to walk the same way I'm walking and eat the same things I'm eating and be the same person that I am. Mm -hmm. So much information is geared towards, it's the result of and the cause of further disembodiment, because we just love information, information age, right? Mm -hmm. it, uh, it definitely, hearing you speak, what comes to mind is that, um, and you give this example of the moon landing, that the importance of deploying this as a thing that people will believe uh, at a purely sort of mental level that they have no real experience of is one of those mechanisms to create a very small slight disembodiment right that they have to be in many ways interacting with these ghosts with these ideas that are floating around almost autonomously in the new sphere something that resonates a lot with the the theory of the spectacle by the situationists that that's that that say that this media spectacle has almost become autonomous in its own phantasmatic um one thing that comes to mind is that the 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 the, the reverse of this is that there might be ideas there might be ghosts or phantasmatic elements or mental elements that are aligned with their own bodies as opposed to producing disembodiment they might produce a greater sense of agency and, and situatedness in the self perhaps in Jungian terms more integrated uh selfhood as opposed to this continual fracturing which is such a theme in hollywood continuous fracturing of the personality amongst all of these split memes Mm -hmm. And it also just wanted to drop this, which is the age of the internet has taken the paradigm that was the fact in Hollywood, which was very much sort of gatekept, but it was also pyramidal. In other words, it's it's based on media that is one direction. Uh, it's the television, it's the cinema, it's the radio, it's the song. It's very much top down, whereas today it's become decentralized and perhaps even um, intensified in terms of the speed of the trade. The ghosts move faster and they don't come only from one wizard, if you will. So I guess that all of this really adds to the confusion. So my question is, um, are all ghosts, are all archetypes uh, negative or do you reckon that there might be some who's that, you know, by relating to them might produce uh, 
a greater sense of of self of of, of, of self evolution of uh, some sort of teleology here. Um, I think. Um, that many of the archetypes that are false or that we experience them as false probably correspond with reality. So just as with language, many of the words we use to do correspond with reality, maybe even most, mm. but, but are we, are, are they helping us to connect to that reality is the question. Not, not so much, do they represent something real? Back to Lucifer, but all roads lead to. But are they helping us to connect to the reality that they correspond with? So then, this this pertains to what we're ready for, what kind of knowledge, what kind of information we're ready for that we can actually apply. Moon landing, useless information, no way to apply it, including the fake one. Well, one can. I mean, I'm on the. Uh, the edge here because I'm a writer and a researcher. So if one is a writer and researcher, one can use information in a way to deconstruct and so on. But leaving that aside, um, uh, and, and maybe going back to Lucifer again, well, Lucifer is an example of um, knowledge of reality that I thought I could apply that I couldn't. It was prem it was either it was either false or it was premature. Or a combination of both. So, um, where I'm at currently is in an interesting stage. It's, it's always interesting, I suppose, but irrelevant to this question stage, which is um, that there are many ideas that I once attributed to reality and found meaningful. Uh, that I post Icarus phase had to re-examine and and in a certain sense, in order to balance it out, like with the moon landing, I had to say, I don't believe in any of this anymore. But I was kind of aware the whole time that I didn't really know. I just needed to um pull back from my investment in them. I needed to uncouple my my psyche and my nervous system from those beliefs and uh, disinvest or whatever, you know, withdraw my monies from them, right? I'd invested in Lucifer, I'd invested in alien abduction, I'd invested in shamanism, I'd invested in psychedelics, etc. There's a long list of things I invested in. Um, and I just realized, well, I don't have that much life force to invest particularly when I'm not really sure how to test these realities and my attempts to test them or apply them seems to have gone pretty horribly wrong. So I better just back off. And, and part of that backing off did involve a, um, a compensatory rejection of the belief. Um, and so, um, but in the last few years, I've been, settling down more, relaxing more. And I haven't been revisiting those things necessarily, but because they're still part of my past, my history, they, they still recur. And um, another thing I invested in heavily was my dreams. I used to have very profound vi uh, visionary dreams, lucid dreams, second attention, as in Castaneda's phrase, I was convinced that all that was real. Um, so... Um, but late, so lately I've, I've, I've been allowing myself, well, you know, maybe I did get something positive from psychedelics and you know, maybe uh, there is some truth in Castaneda. Maybe some of those dreams really were true. Um, I've been lowering my guard a bit again and, um, I think the point is, I mean, the reason I'm using this, my own thing as an example, that um, to me, what what's the, the kind of ideas that are helpful are the ones that we can check in the present moment. 
now and i've said this is re very recently on a, a video i just put up and the, the blog post and podcast and whatnot around Dave Oshana and um I use the analogy of a doctor, of going to a doctor to get the facts. And if we don't want to hear the facts, if we don't like what we hear, it's still we still wouldn't say, I don't want to know. We, we do want to know certain facts. Now, uh, with a doctor, that analogy is fairly clear-cut, although maybe, maybe not so clear-cut, because doctors will tell us stuff on certain authority, and we can't necessarily check it. Doctor might say you've got cancer. Well, is it true? Don't know, right? How do you, you, you can't read the tests that they're using. So even in this analogy, uh, we might trust a doctor, but we might be rash to trust them too much. But the, the main point was we do want the facts about our health, potentially, for, I mean, ideally from someone we can trust so that we can act on them. However, there's a spectrum, this is where Dave Ashana came in, there's a spectrum in terms of our physical being and our physical existence is actually not limited to just flesh, blood, and bones. We, we do exist on, and here's, I'll, I'll give you a living example of this question you've asked, we do exist on other dimensions. But can we talk about those other dimensions? Like, I didn't even want to say that. I don't even want to say that we exist on other dimensions because I might not be tuned into those dimensions as I say that, and you, the listener, might not have a clue what I'm talking about, or rather you might have your own clue, which is totally different from what I mean by other dimensions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as so soon, soon as we start to uh, de deviate from, A, what we can agree on, simply and be what we can refer to directly with our senses then we start to emission creep right mm -hmm. so, so so this is a question like are the ideas useful uh, it isn't just like how true they are or how meaningful they are in themselves it's actually how how much how close are we to having a felt sense of their reality so that the idea is simply a little nudge that pops us out of the groove of where we were into the new groove of yeah, we are. We do exist in other dimensions, mm -hmm. and and in nine, ninety nine times out of hundred, they don't. They go into the dissociative realm where, where, yeah, man, I'm in another dimension now, and I can be whoever I want to be. Right? That that <clears throat> we always seem to take these the ideas that, of course, some of them are negative. So the flip side was, oh my God, there are demons all around, right? It isn't always positive, but still we dissociate into a fantasy. So for me, I mean, an example to, re to bring it to specific would be the nervous system again and how uh, the false identity, using a loaded term there already, but here's an example of what I think are useful ideas, gets installed or embedded in the nervous system through through adverse conditioning experiences, trauma. And so our nervous system goes into lockdown, the fascia freezes or co coagulates, and we, our life force isn't able to distribute, and our life force is the intelligence of existence. So we, we are disembodied. That, that those are useful ideas to me because I can refer to my, you know, I've got tension in my neck and shoulder right now, and I know, you know, I can trace some of the triggers and so on and so forth. But I have a felt mm -hmm. experience of that, right? Of, of how much access I have to my life force and what's preventing it, and how that relates to the body right here and now. But it is, it is kind of conceptual, right? It's still idea based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like I noticed on this topic a few years ago now, I got quite seriously into meditation. I went on a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat, which for people who don't know, it's like a, it's a meditation practice that involves moving awareness through the body, essentially what would be called in Western secular terms, a body scan, but it's a far more ancient and powerful practice i think than those who would call it a body scan would let you know anyhow after practicing this for quite some time i noticed that i had this like real sharp pain in my chest almost all the time and also began to get pains in my lower back and the standard materialist reading would be it's just pains that you're getting right but to my experience 
It's been more than that. I've kind of, especially with the, the tightness in the chest, there's been a kind of intuitive understanding that it is related to traumas from growing up that I hadn't worked through. And in fact, as I have been working through them, it has been releasing slightly, but the tightness is still there. I feel it now. It's there almost all the time. And there's something kind of curious about it in that it is a bit of a, a waypoint within my own subjective ontology. It's like going into that place always produces interesting things. If I meditate and go into that space, interesting ideas pop out, things that I hadn't quite processed, things that I that I often feel like, okay, I need to spend some time with that. It's it's a portal into something. Mm, that's great. That's just what we're talking about at the beginning. Discomfort is the key. Yeah? Mm. Do you have any practices that you yourself do for embodying? No. <laughs> I sometimes think I should, but I, then the counterpoint is that practice is, is a very mental approach, isn't it? I should do this, I could do it, right? Um, so maybe I shouldn't say no categorically, but no in the sense, well, Dave, Dave Oshana has energy work methods and I have done those. I haven't been doing them recently, but there are specific, they're pretty loose, really, it's to clearing out toxins in the body. So I have done those and I will do those again in the future. So that that's definitely a, a impartial yes to the question. But the other yes I was going to say that's more qualified is that I, I, I apparently do have practices, but they're ones that I am not aware of until afterwards. Oh, that was, that was, useful wasn't it that um i chose to buy a real beat down old house that i'd have to spend six months renovating and so really get in a deeper relationship to my environment and my body through having to do these fucking ball breaking back breaking sorry uh renovations uh or what came soon after working in a thrift store oh i'm gonna have to actually deal with strangers you know every day and and be sorting through their unwanted goods uh, week after week and learn to relax and actually not get sick or not get depressed and not get triggered the whole time. These are all embodiment practices, absolutely. But it wouldn't necessarily start a workshop, I suppose you could, where you have people working a day in a thrift shop. I should have thought of that before we're leaving Canada. I could have been... Uh, so you know, I could have been getting people to do my shifts at the thrift store and paying me um, because you know we do we have at least one employee who says it's changed her life working in the thrift store because of how because of this exactly this how much she opened up and discovered new ways of being in the world so anyway so yeah I mean there are mm -hmm. There's there's no end of opportunities to practice embodiment, are there? I mean, we we we're in a body, um, but then there's also no end of temptations to uh, avoid it. There's also I noticed in what you said, like to start a workshop for getting people in working in thrift shops. Right? I don't know. It's kind of a joke, but it does point to something I'm very aware of, which is this drive to to package commercialize or at least to teach to, to be like oh i found something i need to share this with everybody and there's a humongous industry um around this nowadays and it's something i spend a lot of time thinking of in that i mentioned the meditation but really what i've gotten much in, more into in the last two years is is yoga and i'm so mindful that yoga is probably one of the most commercialized industries in the world at the moment and to the extent that I feel like a lot of what gets practiced as yoga is actually often the complete opposite. It's more of an escape than it is an embodiment going in. And perhaps often I'm practicing it as an escape rather than an embodiment and going. And I like to think that I try to practice in a way that's mostly with, um, with, with, with kind of older teachers who don't seem to have this like, new age um, 
businessman style mentality within, but I'm sure I can fall into the traps. I'm sure we all do. Um, and I'm just, I'm just riffing here. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this, on the, as I said, the commercialization of this personal growth or whatever you want to call it industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure I do. I wrote a piece called the spiritual marketplace a while back. Um, I think commercialization or monetization can't always be a bad thing. It's some of the obstacles that people have to um, consulting with uh, Dave, this chap I keep referring to, keep name dropping today, um, is that he charges. Right? Why should he charge? Why are you charging for being enlightened? You know, it's, it's, it, where, I mean, people don't have that problem with people charging for yoga, but um, there is this general idea that if you put a price tag on it, somehow it's going to corrupt it. And I don't think this, this is accurate at all. I think that's just ridiculous, of course. I mean, plumbers charge for plumbing. Why shouldn't um, genuine guides to, to well-being charge for guiding? Um, so I don't think that's the problem so much. I think it, the problem is more the faddishness. And I think that they're clearly comp uh, uh, whatever the word is, I mean, uh, complementary, that uh, when something becomes a fad or as it does, it gets more commercialized and vice versa. You get these audience cults and people who do things, let's say, for the wrong reasons, perhaps, or, or perhaps for you know, not fully conscious reasons. Um, I mean, I used to do yoga, uh, and the only reason I stopped was because they stopped doing it in real time post COVID and I didn't want to do yoga on zoom. It seemed absurd to me. So, um, and my, my, my approach with yoga and it was an older, uh, Iyenga teacher. I think that she was pretty good for myself was just focus on the body. And this is what my body needs is some good rigorous stretching a couple of times a week and really simple. Like this is not, I didn't see it as a spiritual discipline at all. And I even tuned out when she talked about that kind of stuff. Cause to me, I, I don't want to be part of the church of yoga. I've got a lot of resistance to that. And I don't want to turn this into some sort of virtue self signaling that, Oh, I'm a good person. Cause I do yoga twice a week kind of thing. I think, I think the problem, if you, if you like, is, to do with how the identity, the false identity, the constructed identity, whatever we're going to call this, the foreign implant, um, <clears throat> co-ops, puts its, puts its fingers on whatever it is and co-ops it and uses it as a way, as a way to um, circumvent real awakening by turning it into another tool in its arsenal. And that's when it becomes corrupted, like we ourselves corrupt it. But then, of course, you know, our culture is... As part of what I was just referring to earlier, when people find uh, certain information or facts or practices that do correspond with the reality, but but rather than helping them, the person connect to that reality, they allow them to create a dissociated internal mental counterfeit of the reality and then have a relationship with that. Um, that clearly, and then the, and then they reinforce it by becoming a teacher of the dissociation art that they've developed. Even yoga could be that, as in if people are doing yoga, but they're staying in their heads thinking, it's so great that I'm doing yoga or whatever else. Oh, I'm going to get to the next grade and I'll become a yoga teacher, right? or maybe going to meet a partner or whatever. You know, there's any number of reasons that that we might do yoga, even or some kind of if you're like walking in nature, people walk in nature and they look around and think nature's so beautiful, I love it. And they feel virtuous because they can appreciate nature. And but so that they're in a headspace there again. Like really being in nature, and I'm not saying I'm that good at it, besides the physical exercise, is is just about observing what's in nature without any sort of value judgment, which always comes from the identity. This is beautiful, this is ugly, this is you know what's lovely clean air and fresh water. I think if we're adding that overlay 
we're already dissociating. So I think it's very subtle what you're talking about. And sure, we're all going to do it. As I said, the traps are everywhere. But still, it's better to dissociate a bit while doing yoga with a good teacher than, than you know, something else. At least we are actually doing something with our body and ditto being in nature itself is, is healing. Even if we're off, you know, I, what I tell myself, if I'm walking in nature and um, my mind's going off so much, so I walk for an hour and I realize I didn't even notice anything around me, rather than beat myself up, I say, oh, well, that was a good way to work off a whole bunch of bullshit then, wasn't it? Right? Actually, we do have mm. to off gas. Anyway. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Jason, I'm happy to wrap up here, unless, Daniel, you have anything else to add. I think we've been through, through a good a good uh, distance today. That went fast. Is that oh my god, that was two hours. Yep. Yeah. Flew by, didn't it? What did for me anyway? It did, it did. Yeah, well I've enjoyed it very much. You're, you're both very on the ball and I like that, obviously. It's quite a rare experience for me. So uh, I'll recommend some other guests for you if you if you're interested, because I think I think you uh, hold a, a good space. Yeah, that would be fantastic if you could. And if you want to come back sometime as well, that would be wicked. Okay, sure. And maybe once I've made it to Spain and I can tell you what the life of Galician farmer is like. Or what. Oh, yeah, you and Daniel can talk about Iberia. <laughs> and I'll stand here as a, as a British person still in the British Isles thinking, God, what the fuck are they on about? <laughs> <laughs> sounds good sounds really good yeah yeah well thanks anyway for for having me and uh oh, i hope to see you around some maybe in the real world one one day you're you're in the right continent anyway daniel you're in europe as well in europe as well yeah i'm in slovenia right now all right yeah, interesting yeah, well, I hope to set something up. That's the, that's the plan, is to create a, a refuge for the end times without any apocalyptic trappings, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, bring people on for rich working retreats and participatory community building, whatever it turns into, milking goats and the rest of that. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Actually, I uh, once did it in an Airbnb in, in Galicia where I think that was, that was, uh, that was what was being done. So this lady from the Netherlands, she went there, she took a bunch of like houses that were falling down. She rebuilt the whole complex. It was beautiful in the middle of the oak trees. It was a really beautiful, beautiful time there. Ah, all right. So you've had a taste of it. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, well, if you got any information on that, let me have it. Because that's, that's more or less the plan in, in a nutshell. Yeah. I'd rather be higher up and with, with beautiful valley views than surrounded by oak trees. But otherwise, mm. it's pretty much a dead match. Let me... Let me pull it up, and I'll and I'll, uh, and I'll I can maybe s send it to you on email. Yeah. Pull it up. Yeah. I'll share my details with uh, with you. These right. details. All right. Well, it's a convergence. Anyway, I'm always looking for these convergences. I'm going to use that word actually instead of synchronicities from now on. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I never liked that word much. Yeah, you know, when things converge like that, we know that we're kind of tuning into the same wavelength. Well, we don't know, but we might be. Put it here on Zoom. It's as good a, a thing to aim at as anything. And yeah. there's a node within existence to look out to clutch on. onto. Galicia has been a particular convergence. It just keeps it coming up since we've chosen to try to try and move there. Sounds good, Jason. I just, uh, no, I sent you the wrong thing. Didn't I? I did. <laughs> well, show we wrap up and then we can continue talking via email. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Guys, thank you. Let's do that. Right. Oh, should I pitch? Does Thanks, Jason. Do you any info or something? Uh, do, like? uh, I mean, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, if you'd like I, to, yeah, please do. Yeah, please please just, do. Just, just the website, auticulture, A-U-T-I, culture.com. There's a weekly liminalized podcast called The Liminalist. I'm not sure where it's going currently. 
it's always been very conversational but so i think i'm just going to go more and more into that and looking for people to interview just just people who are who i converge with i have conversations on that and then 16 maps of how the unraveling of hollywood superculture it's actually i'm just waiting as we speak for the hardback to arrive the proof so i can approve it paperback's already on its way anyway it should be published by uh, the paperback by the end of october and the hardback in november they can order that at, at my website if you're interested in such things and um, otherwise uh, I, I also encourage people to reach out if they've uh, liked anything they've heard just reach out personally uh, it's jason with a u at protonmail.com just send me a line that's, that's my preferred means of, um, that's my preferred result from these kind of things is just one-to-one -one connections fabulous all right guys thank you so much let's wrap it up wrap it it's a wrap take care okay that's Bye. a wrap we hope you enjoyed the show consider becoming our patron and helping us put out more content like this patreon.com forward slash techno social